Professor of Economics at Smith and is a recognized authority on the economics of sport. Andrew's new book, <laughs> which we have, is Circus Maximus, The Economic Gamble Behind Hosting the Olympics and the World Cup. It was uh, out in January. Uh, Frank DeFord mentioned Circus Maximus recently on NPR called Andrew our premier sports economist. Andrew is the author of other numerous books, among them May the Best Team Win, Baseball, Economics, and Public Policy, National Pastime, How Americans Play Baseball, and the Rest of the World Plays Soccer, and most recently, The Sabermetric Revolution, Assessing the Growth of Analytics in Baseball. There's much more to tell, but I will go forward. It says you're 45 on the uh, United Nations Center, so I'm giving your age. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm also 45. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, he has been a successful entrepreneur, and he served 14 years on the executive leadership team of the Boston-based global healthcare companies, Best Doctors, Inc. Falsha played a lead role in helping grow the company from non-employees to over 600. The company was named to Inc. Magazine's list of fastest growing private companies in America in 2013, 2012, and 2011. As a candidate in the November 2014 mass gubernatorial election, I'm going to call you Evan, it surpassed the 3% threshold required by state law for the United Independent Party to earn official party status in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Evan is the founder of the new United Independent Party in Massachusetts. The UIP is spearheading the people's vote, a ballot question that would give the people the right to be heard. Whatever you think of the event, this is an issue that affects the wallets of families across Massachusetts. Thank you. I'm going to just take one quick minute to thank everybody for being here and to let you know the, the concept behind having this meeting and also for, to thank Deb and, and George for putting together this <coughs> great uh, event. Thank you. It's really cool to be able to have someone who's actually literally written a book on Olympics to be able to present here. One of the things when we found in the United Independent Party that I thought was so important is that voters could be educated with the best information about whatever the issue might be. Um, I've come to my own conclusions as to where I stand on what the Olympics are about, but what we're going to, what I certainly will be doing today is presenting the information that led me to where I am, but also to make sure that you're educated and you could come out a different way as well on the <coughs> issues. Um, but fundamentally, this is about education, engagement. We're going to have lots of Q&A opportunity and the opportunity to act if you want to be involved in what we're doing. So thank you again for being here. Thank you again to, to Deb and George. We do have some, there's some cameras and audio recording people here, so you'll be, I don't know, on the record, just like the rest of us. But Andy, professor, please, thank you. So being a professor, I like to roam back and forth rather than sitting down, I hope that's okay. Um, I guess I, I wasn't aware that I was supposed to talk about the history of the Olympics, so I'll start off with a very, few very brief remarks about that, then I want to focus on some of the economic and financial issues as they pertain to Boston 2024. What I can say in summary fashion about the Olympics is that the economic record is dismal. There probably are just two Olympic Games that have been economically successful. One of those games was in 1984 in Los Angeles when the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, was calling for bids to see who wanted to host the 1984 games, there was only one city that came forward. It was Los Angeles. It wasn't even a city, it was a group of private executives that put together a committee that said that they would try to make it happen. So the IOC didn't have any choice at all. The reason IOC didn't have any choice was because in 1968 in Mexico, the Olympics were a disaster. Um, the 200 students were killed in a protest just before the Olympics began. The broadcasters were talking about air pollution. At, at, towards the middle of the games, uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith, and two, uh, two successful black athletes, had a gold medal and, and a silver medal. Uh, no, it was bronze. It was a gold and a bronze medal, and they were on the, the, the 
winner's stand and they had the black power fist up in the air. These games took place, by the way, right after uh, Martin Luther King was killed. A lot of the black athletes were thinking of boycotting the, the games altogether. Uh, after, after Tommy Smith and John Carlos did that, they were kicked off the U.S. team and the other black athletes staged a protest. It was not a good game in, ter games in terms of optics. It didn't help Mexico City at all. In 1972, Munich, most of you will remember what happened there. there were 16 people were killed. Terrorists went into the Israeli camp. Uh, in 1976 in Montreal, it was the biggest economic disaster ever for the Olympics. It was totally mismanaged. The final bill was nine and a half times the bid bill. Uh, they were paying off their debt for 30 years. So when it came time to bid for the 19, uh, 1984 games, nobody wanted to bid except that there was this group in Los Angeles. The group in Los Angeles said to the IOC, knowing that they had a lot of leverage, they said, we'll do this under two conditions. Condition number one is that you backstop the games financially. And that had uh, never happened before and never happened since. If Boston hosts the games in 2024, either the city of Boston or the Commonwealth will have to backstop them financially, meaning that if there's a financial shortfall, that we'll be on the hook. It, it means that straightforwardly and simply, that's all that it means. But the, the, the Los Angeles committee that was bidding in, in 1978 for the 84 games said, we want you to fight, you the IOC to financially backstop it, we're not gonna do it. And the IOC didn't have a choice, they said okay. The other thing that, that Peter Uberoff, who ran the, the Los Angeles games, said to the IOC, um, is that we want you to let us use our facilities that we used when we hosted the games back in 1932. We don't want to build new facilities. I'm simplifying a little bit, but basically the IOC said okay to that as well. So at the end, of the, the end of the 1984 games, as a result of those factors, and also as a result of the fact that Peter Uberoff actually did a really marvelous job in managing the games and introduced a new sponsorship model that was very successful, the Los Angeles committee had a surplus of $215 million. Other games that were, the other games that I think could be qualified as successful, although some people would dispute it, are the games in Barcelona in 1992. And very briefly, I think the story there is, number one, that after Franco died in 1975, people in Barcelona, and they had elections, people in Barcelona got together and they had a new vision for their city. The vision had to do with opening the city to the sea, uh, taking away a warehousing and manufacturing district that had sprung up right next to the Mediterranean Sea and blocked the rest of the downtown area from the sea. Uh, that was part of the vision, and they had some other elements of the vision too, but they developed a plan based on that vision in the late 1970s and early 1980s. They had a plan for their city before the idea of hosting the Olympics came along. When the idea came along, they folded the Olympic plan into and made, and made it work for the implementation of the plan that already existed. I think that, that reversed the typical order. Every other city that I know of has not had a plan, not had a vision, and simply said, okay, we're gonna host the Olympics and then we'll worry about a plan. Then we'll, then we'll figure out what will make our city great. And when you do that, you're doing it within the parameters that are given to you and the constraints that are given to you by the IOC, which means you have to have 32 venues and you have to have special transportation lanes and you have to have a media center and you have to do all of these different things. So when you make a plan that first requires you to take care of the IOC, it's really their plan, it's not your plan. And in those circumstances, it doesn't work out. Cities lose money. Now one other, thing, one other thing that I want to say about the history of the Olympics is that you very often hear commentators say this, and I know you, you'll hear John Fish say it over and over again, and you hear Mayor Walsh say it, that cities either break even or they, they have a surplus, or they call it a profit, when, when they host the Olympics. Here's the reality of that. The, the Olympic budget really has three different bins to it. One bin is the cost of operating the games for 17 days. Another bin is the cost of building the Olympic venues, the development budget. And another bin is the infrastructure, what you have to do with trans basically transportation and communications infrastructure. When they say that they break even, they're referring only to the first bin. They're referring to the costs of operating the games for 17 days. A few other costs are thrown in there from time to time. But it's the operating budget. It's not these other two bins also. It's just look, look at the cost of the operation of the games and compare that with the revenue that comes in from the games. So what happens when we do that? I think the most instructive example to look at is London. It's the most recent Summer Olympics. 
And London, of course, is a, is, a, is a very developed city like Boston is. It wouldn't make a lot of sense to compare Boston to Sochi or to compare Boston to, to Beijing because the, the economies are in much, much different shape and require much, much more infrastructure investment than Boston does. So let's, let's talk about it in terms of the costs in, in, in London. What happened in, what were the costs of operating the games in London? First, think about the money that they got. From the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, they gave London $712 million from international television contracts. They got $990 million from selling tickets to the, to the various events. They got $1.1 billion in domestic sponsorships, and they got just under $400 million in international sponsorships. Then they got $100 million in licensing. All of this is money that came from hosting the games. All together, you put all that together, it's about $3.3 billion. It's the amount that came to London. London's expenses for, the operating expenses for the games that they, uh, that they admit to in their public accounting statements were around $4 billion. The London government, not London government, the UK government, chipped in the difference, and so at the end of the day, they were able to say, okay, with, with the money that we got from the UK government, and with all the money we got from the IOC, compare all of that to the cost that we had, and we broke even. But that doesn't talk about, that leaves completely out of the picture, all of the building that they did. They had to build an 80,000 capacity Olympic Stadium. They had to build a pentathlon stadium. They had to build growing courses, and 32 venues altogether. According to, according to their own audit report, they spend $18.1 billion. Now that number, it really depends on what exchange rate you use. Somebody might say 18.8, .8, somebody might say 17.5, but it was basically it was $18 billion that they spent and they took in the numbers that I just told you about before, $3.3 billion. $18 billion on one end, going out, $3.3 billion coming. That's not a very good financial balance. The only way you could justify that kind of uh, undertaking is if there was something in the long run that was happening that was beneficial. And the idea is, and you'll hear Mayor Walsh say this again and again, you'll hear John Fish say it again and again, that if we host the games, we'll be put on the map. Whatever that means. I, I, somebody should check the map, maybe we're not there now. I don't know. <laughs> but if, if Boston is put on the map, the, the, the claim is that all of a sudden we'll get more and more tourism in Boston and Massachusetts, and all of a sudden we'll get more foreign investment, and all of a sudden we'll have more international trade, we'll have more employment. The economic record, the economic analysis done by scholars who are not paid by one side or another, are just trying to understand the truth, using econometrics, is that it's very, very difficult for any of those things to happen. You cannot depend on any of those things happening, any of those long-run benefits to happen down the road. Now, Boston 2024 says that they're going to finance all this with private money, so you don't have to worry the taxpayer is not going to be involved. Well, think about it for a moment. They're planning to build a, uh, an Olympic stadium in Wadet Circle, south, a little bit south of South Station in Boston, with a 60,000 seat capacity. London had 80,000 seat capacity. The one that they're planning in Boston, so they say, is not going to have luxury boxes. It's not going to have club seats. It's not going to have catering. And it's going to be 60,000 instead of 80,000. London had all of those premium seating and revenue generating accoutrements in their stadium. Boston is not going to have it. London generated $990 million on their ticket sales. Boston says they're going to generate $1.2 billion. How are they going to do that if all of the stadiums are smaller and more Spartan? It's, it's, it's hard to fathom. But even if they do, even if they were to generate $1.2 billion, their operating costs, their projected operating costs are 4.5, four, excuse me, 4.7 billion dollars. Where is the balance going to come from? Well, if you look at their bid document, they say other revenues. <laughs> There's no specification of what they are, and it's very hard to imagine what they would be. London actually experienced a 5% decrease in tourism during the games. If you look at August, August of 2012, and you compare it to August of 2011, there are 5% fewer tourists in London. Why? 
Well, because tourists stay away, fearful of the crowds and congestion and high prices. Some might even rationally be concerned about security incidents. Normal tourists don't go. If normal tourists don't go to the city during the Olympics, and instead you get Olympic fans, the Olympic fans go to the Olympic Games. They don't go to Piccadilly Circus. They don't go to the London Theater. They don't go to the National Galleries or the Tate Gallery. Those are the things that normal tourists do. Normal, normal tourists go back home and they tell their friends, neighbors, and relatives, London's great. Here's what I went to, and here's the restaurants I ate at, and everything was, was a wonderful experience. And then their friends, neighbors, and relatives want to go visit London. That supposedly is, the, according to the European Trade Operators Association, word of mouth is the best way of promoting tourism. But you lose that when you have people who have gone to watch the Olympic competitions, because they can't come back and say they went to the London Theater, or they went to the, they could, but very, very, very rarely do they do that. They don't say that they went to these tourist attractions. It doesn't help London either in the short run or in the long run. Beijing had a reduction in tourist arrivals of 20% in, in August of 2008 when they hosted. So it's, it's very unlikely that you're going to get that kind of um, long, long -term, long, either short-term or long-term boost from tourism. There's also no evidence that you get boosts in international trade or in, air, or in foreign investment. So going back to the Boston bid, they say that uh, they're going to generate $1.2 billion um, in, in ticket sales. Very, very unlikely number. Uh, they say there's not going to be any private money, uh, excuse me, any public money. They say it's all going to be financed privately, but think about that. They have um, uh, 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 what they call a development budget that's for 3.4 billion dollars is their development budget. This is the price of developing the venues. On top, over and beyond that, they have uh, this. They allocate 1.5 or 6 billion dollars for the Olympic Village they're going to build in Dorchester at UMass Columbia Point. They say all of that is going to be financed by private-public partnerships. They have not identified one company yet that is interested in investing in any of these venues. They might eventually identify such a company. Maybe they'll identify a real estate developer that wants to build the Olympic Village with the thought that they'll turn the Olympic Village into profit-making apartments afterwards. It's not an easy thing to do, but it's possible. Part of the problem, if you do that, is that the developer is going to want to be able to sell his new apartments on, at market rate. They're not going to want it to be low-income housing, otherwise they won't be able to make any money off of their investment. In London, they had a private developer who's going to build the Olympic Village. It cost $1.7 billion, and, the, and they had, the, the lease was signed, the contract was made. The developer, Lendlease, a company called Lendlease, pulled out, and the UK government was left holding the tab. They had to build, they had to build the Olympic Village. So when you, when you have the Boston 2024 people saying, okay, we're going to do this with private-public partnerships, and so there won't be any public money, you have to be very concerned about that. Because there's no guarantee that these companies are going to come forward. What, what private company is going to want to come forward and pay for the Olympic Stadium? Why would you build, their plan is to build a stadium for $500 million, 60,000 capacity, and then they're going to tear it down when the games are over so that they don't have a white elephant sitting there. Well, what private company is going to want to put money into that? There's no advertising, there's no promotional value for having your name attached to 17 days. It's certainly not $500 million of promotional value to do that. And they haven't identified one company. How can they go to the public and say there's not going to be public money, but that we need all these venues and we're going to eventually we'll find a company that's going to build them for us? They say that they're going to have an infrastructure. How am I doing on time? Okay. They say they're going to have an infrastructure budget of $5.2 billion. This is, you know, it's primarily transportation infrastructure that, that they're looking at. They say that all of that $5.2 billion is already allocated for the purposes that, uh, of construction that, uh, that the IOC needs to host the Olympics. It's already allocated. Well, there are a lot of problems with that. First of all, if you look at their bid document and you look at the list of the different transportation upgrades that they need, one billion dollars of, of those are not allocated in the bond bill that the legislature passed in 2014. So there's one billion dollars that's not accounted for at all yet. 
Another problem is that the bond bill that was passed in 2014 isn't actual money yet. It's just an authorization eventually to issue bonds, but it's over a 20-year period. So roughly, if you wanted to have all of that $5.2 billion uh, infrastructure investment take place before the Olympics, which obviously they do, you would have to advance roughly half of that. Roughly $2.6 billion of that is now slated to happen between 2025 and 2035. They're going to have to advance that. If you advance that money, then it means you have to knock something else off the docket. There's some other social service that's not going to happen as a result, or they're going to have to raise taxes. Another problem is that back in November, we all voted not to index the gas tax. Gas tax money by the state constitution goes directly to the transportation budget. The fact that the gas tax is not going to be indexed, indexed means it goes up with inflation, the fact that it's not going to be indexed means that there's a $2 billion additional shortfall in the budget that they passed for the, the, the bond bill in, in 2014. Bill Strauss, who's the head of the, the House Transportation Committee in, in the state legislature, estimates that to do what, what they want to do for the Olympics and infrastructure is going to cost $13 billion. So if you take that for a moment, take that $13 billion, add the 4.7 for the operating costs of the games, add $3.4 billion, and you have 21, all, all, you have 21.1 billion dollars. Actually, right now, and that's without the cost overruns. Remember, the cost overruns on average over, since 1976 for the summer games has been 3.5 times. I'm not saying it would be that egregious for Boston, but if it were, We'd be looking at a final bill that was over $60 billion. I don't think that's where we're going. But the point is that there are billions and billions of dollars that are going to have to be spent, and there is not, there's not private money available for it. And the only place where that can come from is either the Boston city budget, which annually is $2.7 billion. It's nowhere near large enough to, to cover any, any deficits that are going to appear. Um, or it has to come from the state budget. So I think that, that financially, this is a very problematic story, a very problematic future, a very expensive future, if we go ahead with these games. And why are we doing it? We're doing it because it's going to put us on the map and because supposedly it's going to do something for the city's economy. But as I said at the outset, the economic research says, no, that's not going to happen. I'll stop with that cheerful note. <laughs> He's, he's good, right? <laughs> and now think about this, because there's, a, there's, a, there's this broader story about what's happened with these Olympic Games, which is a very important part of the context. So back in 2013 was when they first came with the idea. They sent out the IOC sent letters to uh, US cities to say, we want you to bid. And Boston got on the map because Mitt Romney talked to Deval Patrick, this has been published, and said, hey, we should, Boston should do this. There was a group that then got formed, said we should study this. The legislature actually went and created a committee to study this. This gentleman, this professor, was one of the people that should have been on the committee to study whether the Olympics should come to Massachusetts, but he was not. He was asked to be, right? That's what he wrote about. Stan Rosenberg. Stan Rosenberg asked him to be, but they didn't actually pick him. The, the committee ended up being made up of a group of people from the construction industry. Okay? And they came out with a report that basically said, yeah, this is worth looking at, shockingly. And um, the trouble is then several months later, suddenly, we are picked by the USOC as the city. And I, I keep saying city. And I think this is a really important point for people to remember. The folks that are pushing the Olympics, the Boston 2024 group, keep talking about it as a Boston Olympics. Boston, 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 Boston. And here we are standing in Northampton, and we know that the reality of these Olympics is that it's going to affect everybody in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Even reading their own bid documents, what they propose are events in lots of places outside of Boston. Most of it, in, almost all of it, is in eastern Massachusetts, but we're talking about close in towns like Brookline, further out like Lowell, Salem, Quincy. I mean, there's plenty of venues that have been set up that are not Boston, but they like to talk about it as Boston. Now, Boston, of course, is, a, is the biggest city in Massachusetts, but it is a small piece of the state. And as all of us know who live here and understand how Massachusetts works, 
the cities and towns of Massachusetts really don't operate independently. They get so much of their funding from the state of Massachusetts to pay for schools, for roads, for public safety, for all sorts of other needs and requirements. So it's really not even possible for a city in Massachusetts to take on a mega project like this one without having state involvement in it. And indeed, when you look at the bid documents, they, they know that this is true. They know that this is true. Even though they say, and it is interesting to read the bid documents, um, I find it as a business person when I read them that these are, it's very nice and glossy and, and um, pretty looking, but the content is really, really light. And it makes you wonder how bad the presentations must have been from the U.S. cities that lost <laughs> that Mars got picked. But they say things. It says, a bid budget that does not rely on a single tax dollar. A single tax dollar. All right, so let's, let's just explore this for a moment. In the process leading up to this point, some of the things that we know that have already taken place include the fact that the mayor of Boston, Marty Walsh, and the chancellor of UMass Boston were out in California actually presenting this bid to the U.S. Olympic Committee. Now, these people work for us as taxpayers, and they're out there presenting this, which is on behalf of a private organization. Their time and effort and brain power is the state's their employers, the taxpayers, to use, and they decided to use it in this way. There are people from the mayor of Boston's office now working in Boston 2024. In fact, one of his key uh, lieutenants, a gentleman by the name of Joe Rull, who Marty has described as his right-hand guy, his fix-it guy, he sent him to go off and work in Boston 2024. Rich Davey used to be the Secretary of Transportation in Massachusetts, is now the CEO of Boston 2024. Um, Doug Rubin, who was the chief political consultant to um, Attorney General Coakley, is the head of the uh, PR and, and public relations side of Boston 2024. Mintz Levin, the law firm, or Bob Popio, longtime lawyer to such notables as Billy Bulger uh, and others, is the chairman of that law firm, and, and he is the head of the legal process at Mintz Levin. ML Strategies, which is Mintz Levin's lobbying arm where Governor Well works and where Senator Mocowan works is playing a lead role in this. Mocowan is, is one of the name listed people as head of the groups. <coughs> they have a, a group called the Innovation Committee, which is headed up by the CEO of, St of State Street Bank, which recently received <coughs> massive tax breaks from the Commonwealth and City of Boston to build some buildings in Boston, as well as Vertex Pharmaceuticals, same deal. Everyone's doing their part now to give back to the community, I suppose. Now, I don't, I don't question the good intentions of people, but I do, as a voter, look at that and say there's a strange overlap happening between what is government and what is these private groups, Boston 2024, looking to bring the Olympics to Massachusetts. It's a strange overlap where voters and taxpayers should look and say, what, who, who's exactly working for who? Who's working for who? And when you see the numbers of people that are moving back and forth, there's also, by the way, there's a communications consultant that works for Governor Baker's administration that's also consulting for Boston 2024. Whose business are they doing when they're meeting in private at Boston 2024 on these issues? Whose business are they doing? When they decide and you go through the bid documents and you see the proposals of the many transportation projects that they think need to be pushed up the priority list for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and which ones need to be pushed down in the priority list? Whose behalf is that being done? Who's going to benefit from that? When you hear the mayor of Boston has signed documents that said that employees of the city couldn't speak ill about the bid, and then of course he went back and changed it. Now, the lawyers that negotiated that in the first place and then the ones that went back and renegotiated it worked for the government. That's taxpayer money, isn't it? If they are doing stuff like this. So he signed that. He says there shouldn't be a vote in Boston on this issue. It's not up to him, but he says there shouldn't be a vote in Boston. He, when pressed on it, talked about a statewide vote, which is what we're heading up. He said, well, I won't stand in the way. They've got a right to do that. They can do that. But again, whose business are they, are they doing is fundamentally the, the challenge that we face. So when you think about the process of what's happening here, it's really important to recognize that. When they first submitted this bid, and when most of us, the first most of us heard about the Olympics was when we were picked by the U.S. Olympic Committee. 
I don't know if that was, was that your experience, Tim? Yeah. Right? You, you, you see suddenly there's Mayor Walsh and Governor Baker. They're standing in front of, of the logo of Boston 24, which is the first time I ever saw that logo. Now, as a candidate for governor, I think I was asked about the Olympics once. This was not on the radar, at least of people who weren't involved in it. So they're standing in front of that logo. They're all excited. They're celebrating. This is the greatest thing ever. People said, well, can we see what you bid? And they said, we're not revealing that information. We're not going to, we're not going to do that. When you go and you look at the bid documents, it says things in them like, we want to offer up our most precious assets to the Olympic movement. They, use, they actually use these terms. And they talk about things like the waterfront and colleges and universities. But again, what, who, who decided that that's something that we should do? The U.S. Olympic Committee picks Massachusetts. And again, they even will call it periodically a Commonwealth Games. They keep saying this. Um, and I think it's, again, an interesting, it's, it's an accurate thing to say. But then, once again, then all I should have a say in it. Um, these assets that they're coming delivering up are our assets. They're our assets. And to me, when I look at what is going on with this Olympic Games, the question is, what is the vision of the future that is being proposed? Because the backers of Boston 2024, make no mistake about it, have made it very, very clear that their vision of the future is one in which our public policy planning in the state of Massachusetts is focused on planning those 17 days in 2024. They've made that exceedingly clear. That's what they think is important. Mayor Walsh was saying that, you know, the good thing about the Olympics is that the experience of these storms that have affected eastern Massachusetts so badly is that now we've got the impetus we need to actually deal with our transportation infrastructure. As if the idea of hundreds of thousands of people unable to get to work isn't enough. We've got to impress the princes and princesses and sheiks and connected aristocrats from around the world with a, with a wonderful games in Massachusetts and that what should drive our policy. Well, they call that dreaming big and thinking big about the future. I completely disagree with that. I think dreaming big and thinking big would actually be taking responsibility for dealing with the problems that we face. And clearly we need to elect new people if these guys can't do it. But in the meantime, they shouldn't be able to pick what happens over the next 10 years. Who decides? Who decides? So the vision they have is this. 17 days worth of games in Massachusetts. 17 days worth of it billions of dollars allocated towards those priorities. No action on all the other issues that really matter. Enormous amounts of debt. There's no way to do this without debt. It affects everybody. Priorities that are not dealt with. So the concern that all of us should have and the questions that need to be asked are the kinds of things that you hear Andy talking about here so eloquently. They have proposed. And you, and you really have to look at their materials to see it, but they have proposed over $14.3 billion just in their proposal of what would be spent for these Olympic Games. $14.3 billion. Inherent in what they do with these Olympic Games is that they require that the place where it's hosted guarantee anything that doesn't happen. And Andy pointed this out. So if there's a cost overrun, well, that's for the taxpayers to cover. Because the Olympics are saying, we want you to deliver an Olympics games, Olympic Games, and we don't want to hear about the fact that you couldn't finish your stadium. You're going to finish it, and the taxpayers are going to pay for it. If a sponsor disappears or never exists, that's for the taxpayers to cover. You know, think about this. Imagine if it was 15 years ago and we were planning an Olympics in Northampton in 2015. I don't know, just to make something up. And we had Blackberry as our sponsor. And it's 2001, we're like, hey, it would be awesome, Blackberry. And then all of a sudden it's like, hey, they're gone. Yeah. Well, all right, good news, the taxpayers will cover it. And how hard would you work to make sure you had a backup plan after Blackberry if you already had the taxpayers? And we have unlimited money, right? So what's the big deal? Um, this, is, this is the business model of the Olympic Games. And look, you, uh, on some level, just as a, as a voter, I'd say, well, geez, isn't that kind of interesting how, look, you had a business and you could get the state to completely shift everything it did in order to make sure that you made money, I guess good for you, right? But we don't have to stand for that. They're organized. They've been working on this for years. They're not interested in what voters think. They're not interested in what voters think. The polling on the Olympics are fascinating. So the mayor in, in the bid documents told the people at the, at the uh, USOC that there's no opposition. In Massachusetts to this thing. He, he, there's a speech, you know, there have been efforts to have FOIA requests around stuff. Um, and there's a lot of things that are at the, 
Boston 2024 that we can't get to with FOIA, but there's things at the city of Boston and, and elsewhere that people have been trying to get. And there's the text of remarks that Mayor Walsh gave to the USOC in which he said, listen, I know for many years as an organizer, as a union leader, what opposition looks like. And I can tell you there is no organized opposition to this in Massachusetts or in Boston. Now, he claims he never actually delivered that portion of his remarks. We don't know because it was a private meeting. And we don't know what was actually said at this meeting. Um, but the mentality is very clear. We don't matter. We don't matter. So to me, the reason we're doing this is to educate, to provide information, and to provide an avenue for action. So I, I know we've been talking for a while. We want to answer all your questions. We want to answer all your questions. We've got plenty of time to do it. So um, yeah, look, it's snowing outside. The news. <laughs> Everything's going to be fine. So, so who's, got, who's got a good question about the Olympics? Yes. Can I just field questions and just do it? My question is about the Olympics. My question is how does one um, elicit, how does one elicit a statewide uh, election? Valid um, question. That's a very good question. <laughs> Did you hear the question? How do we do a ballot initiative in Massachusetts? Here's how it works. They've set up a system that's not easy. Because they don't want it to be, but it doesn't matter. We're doing it anyway. So this is how it works. You have to draft language that actually looks like a law. You can't actually have a question that's on the ballot that says, do you think that we should have the Olympics in Massachusetts or not? So you would have to draft it as a law. In Colorado, this is the good news. In Colorado in the 1970s, they wanted to bring the Olympics there in 76. It ended up in Innsbruck. Right? Innsbruck. Yeah. Well, that was the summer. So they wanted to bring it to Colorado, and the taxpayers, the voters of Colorado, put a ballot question out, and they said no taxpayer money could be used for the Olympics. Well, that passed, like 60 40, and that caused the IOC to say, well, I think we should probably go somewhere else, because there's no soccer in Colorado. Hang on one second, we just finished the process for Massachusetts. Actually, they were awarded They were. They gave it back. They gave it back, exactly. Because of that. Just to be accurate. Absolutely. They were, they, it was not in the process you're talking about now in terms of the so-called uh, preliminary process. They were actually awarded the bid. It's the only one in Olympic history, by the way, that's ever been given that. Yeah. Just, absolutely. Great point. So thank you for that. So so here's the thing. So that, that has happened, and, and he's absolutely right. What's your name, sir? I'm sorry. Ted. Ted. So Ted's right when he says that that happened even later than where we are with this thing. So in Massachusetts, you've got to draft the law, and the way you, you would have to draft it with this is to, is to say no taxpayer money. And um, we're working on that. We've got an attorney, we're, we started that process. You have to go to the Attorney General's office and get that language approved. All right, the Attorney General approves that no later than September 1st of this year. <coughs> September 1st, the Secretary of State then takes that language, and the Secretary of State actually has to print the forms that are used to collect signatures. And they have to print those forms by September 18th. So you've got this weird little window. So we would, we're not allowed to collect signatures until at the latest September 18th of this year. You then have until it's the third week of November to collect the signatures you need. This year you will need 65,000 certified signatures. You've got to get those in 10 weeks, basically, um, certified, which means you probably need more like 80 to 100,000, just to be sure. You submit those by that third week of November. Um, then the proposed bill gets actually put in front of the legislature. The legislature could enact it. Should it not enact it, you can go out and get another 10,000 signatures, which would be in 2016 in the spring. You get those, then it goes in the ballot in November. So it's a very lengthy process, but we're, we're, we're in it. We're in it. Yes? Yeah, a, a few points. One of the things, my, my reaction is. Um, oh, wait a second. So you can concentrate the microphone over. Okay. Sure. Yeah, do you mind if I say your name? It's Joe Bosnia. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, the way you describe it, uh, I, I'm a little troubled because I don't have any problems whatsoever with an economic argument for starters. Uh, bad faith and bad will and greed to put that in up front, I find troublesome. I mean, that's the way it's a capitalist system. We know how things work, but I would be cooler talking about that and much more about process and about economics. Because if the economics are what you claim, then it should be an easy case to make. And the city can't pay for this if the bill is so much higher than the income, the revenue. The city's not going to be able to do it, so it's going to have to be the state. 
which means every mayor in, in the state, uh, all of the governors should be concerned about it. It affects everybody. So it seems to me if you have a really powerful telling argument, we can avoid that, po that political look. We have to talk about process and how could, how could the people who really have an interest in this have something to say. And I would like to hear a way easier than a vote. For example, if every mayor would, would write to, would talk, talk, to their rep, talk to their representatives, I would think, if it's as bad as you say, they're not stupid. Uh, they see that the money that goes to the schools, the money goes there, the money goes there, uh, won't be coming. And so uh, it seems to me we don't, there must be another way to deal with it if the economic case is as bad as you claim it is. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Do you want to comment on the economics? Uh, sure, you want to comment on the politics? I will. <laughs> uh, look, first of all, I, I think yeah, you're right. At one level, I think you're right. And I'm, I'll certainly hold to the economic case that I laid out. But, you know, to some degree, the fix is in here. We, we read yesterday that the Vault Patrick is now, now going to be the ambassador for Boston 2024, being paid to travel around the world to convince you, IOC executive committee members, there are 108 of them, to vote for Boston. Uh, Val Patrick, of course, is the same gentleman who appointed the committee that looked into the feasibility of all this that led to the genesis of 2024. And many people from his cabinet are now working as executives. That His secretary of transportation is now the head, Mr. Davey, of, of uh, 2024. Uh, so I, I think that a lot, a lot of mayors are part of that system, and uh, they, they won't readily just stand up to, to the people, to the power structure in Boston. But I think if, if we talk to them long enough and, and uh, consistently enough, that some of them will. I, I'm not sure that that's a better vehicle, though, than, than, than having a referendum. I, I, it, it's, it's interesting to mention also, because the case is really worse than the one I made it out to be. I didn't have a lot of time. Uh, one, 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 of the, one of the things that I didn't mention is that there's going to be a $2 billion security bill, or approximately. Nobody knows exactly what it would cost, but they've been running about $2 billion in security. Boston 2024 did not include that in their budget. Why not? Because they said that we're going to get the federal government to cover that. <laughs> uh, That's true. Uh, By the way, let's be honest here. I'm trying. The Homeland Security issue. If you look in and you don't really talk about Salt Lake City or the surplus from Salt Lake City, and it wasn't a perfect game, no games are perfect, but let's be, let's be more forthright here. The fact is, Super Bowl, any, any major event, mega event in this country, it gets listed as a homeland security event, which means it becomes a federal requirement to handle that, okay? Now, how they listed there in their bid book, by the way, that's a proof of concept book, that there's going to be iterations of that book, which hopefully become more detailed, that one can ask really measured questions about, and should ask measured questions about. This is not about... So, in terms of Homeland Security, let's be clear that that is not a state bill that is going to be put on... It's going to be put on as taxpayers, as U.S. taxpayers, but not as Commonwealth taxpayers. You're not right. Pardon? You're not right, sorry. You're partially right. Well, tell me how I'm partially right. Okay, I'm, I'm, about, to, I'm right. about to tell you. Please. It, the Super Bowl is not entirely covered. Super, it, these these events, let me, let me talk for a minute. I'll let you talk. Sure. The Super Bowl is classified, and this would be classified potentially as a special national security event, and it would become the responsibility of Homeland Security to organize the security for yeah. it. That's correct. They would have to appropriate money. Go to people in Congress and ask them if that money is automatically appropriated. They'll tell you that it's not. And there are many people in Congress who are already speaking out against any appropriation at all. Where that happens, we're not sure. Where, where it lands, we're not sure. Secondly, the Super Bowl is, has been largely covered in terms of the financial security bill, largely covered by the federal government, but not entirely covered by the federal government. You, you also have the issue that there are going to be Boston security people and Boston police people who will be involved. They'll be integrated into the Homeland Security team. They're not going to be doing their regular jobs. Either that means less security elsewhere in Boston during the games, or it means that they're going to have to be replaced by or covered by people who are working a time and a half overtime. There are going to be a variety of expenses. I didn't claim that the Boston bill would be $2 billion. I'm just saying there's an expense out there that hasn't been budgeted. And it, will, it won't be free. It, it'll, probably be, it'll probably be expensive. 
Another, another bill that I didn't mention is $600 million that the uh, Boston 2024 has agreed with the USOC of the, the sponsorship money that we were talking about. They, they're going to give $600 million of the sponsorship money that comes in from domestic sponsorships to the USOC. So even if they were to get the same amount, and this is in their budget, they're claiming that they're going to get $1.2 billion in domestic sponsorship money. Even if they were to get the same amount that London got, and London, of course, is a bigger city with more corporations, same amount that London got, uh, they're going to, they would get $1.1 billion. That's what London got. But even if they got that, which I think is questionable, they would then take $600 million of that and give it to the USOC. So the amount that actually went to pay for the operation of the games would be $500 million, not $1.1 or $1.2 billion. There are a lot of very profound economic questions here. Uh, in, in terms of in terms of the pol well, go ahead. So this political question that you were asking about with mayor, it's actually a very interesting dynamic that's been happening as you watch it. So you have, from an elected official standpoint, we've got mayors and, and city council people that would be the most interested, you would think, in this, and also people in the state legislature. And it's been it's been very interesting to watch. So the dynamic with mayors, here's two interesting examples. Dominic Sarno in, in Springfield, and I'm forgetting his name right now, but the mayor of New Bedford or two that have actually been fairly active speaking out about this. But what has their position been? They want to have events in their locations. And what they've said is the reason that they want to have that is to help it use it as leverage for their own political uh, priorities, which, again, we could have a good discussion because, for example, Mayor Sarno says he thinks that if they could have volleyball in Julio, for example, which there's some logic to that, maybe some basketball in Springfield, same deal, that it might make it easier to get the rail uh, commuter rail extension built to Springfield. Okay, well, see, there's there's logic to that. In New Bedford, South Coast Rail, same story, right? He wants to have sailing off the coast of New Bedford. So then it becomes easier to say, well, and now we've got to make sure we invest in South Coast Rail. In some ways, it is it is a true statement that people can use the Olympics as a as a leverage for something, all right? But again, the question is, who gets to make those decisions? And so I'm not, I really don't question the intentions of the people involved in Boston 2024. As I said, this is a private money-making organization trying to make money. They're entitled to do that. Absolutely. It's America. It is a capitalist system. My, my question is when we're using taxpayer money and taxpayer guarantees to do it, and more importantly in this case, when we're talking about changing what are the priorities exactly, where does our money get spent? And you're not including taxpayers in that discussion. That's where I start to get very concerned. And when you see the, the economics of it, you'd say, listen, if this thing, if these deals, and, and people in politics are not dumb people, maybe they are, but they're not, they're smart. And they, if, if this thing was so rich with rewards for everybody in Massachusetts, don't you think that they'd be out front jumping up and down talking about how great it's going to be for everybody? We don't see that. What we tend to see, if you listen to people in the legislature, is either silence, which is most interesting to me, silence, and I want each one of them to say, are you in favor of a referendum or not? And if not, why not? Or are you guys even going to vote on this? Or qualified support. There have been some people that have filed legislation to, legislation to try to do some things about it. I, from everybody I talk to, no one thinks that legislation is going to go anywhere. And it's a nice way for people to be able to tell their constituents, hey, I propose some legislation. You see, talking about things like transparency. But um, fundamentally, there's, there's a lot of stuff that you'd say, hey, look, this would be good for New Bedford because we'll build the rail. Hey, this would be good for Springfield because there'll be train lines built. Reshuffling of priorities. Reshuffling of priorities to, the, to this. So more information, the better. The more disclosure, the better. This kind of conversation, this is healthy. This is what should be happening. Unfortunately, I mean, you're an elected official, I don't know, but neither none of us are, right? So we're just sitting here as citizens. Hmm? Okay, good. So, but we're just people talking. Now, you know what it reminds me of a little bit, just being that I'm from Massachusetts? You know how cities and towns are in control of how we do commercial development and residential development? And you've seen the mood in meetings like this if you go to a discussion about a 40B. Got any of those in North Hampton? Yeah. Right? So what's the story always? There's a developer that comes and says, good news, I've got this great project. And, you know, look, I think that we need more affordable housing in Massachusetts, no question about it. But the process is always what gets people. Because very often, and there's one going up, there's two actually proposed in my neighborhood where I live, where the developer comes with this pre-cooked idea. Most voters don't realize that 40B overrides any of their local zoning authority, and then they get mad. They're mad both on the fact that, wait a minute, you mean we're actually powerless? And the answer is yes. 
And then they're mad at the fact that someone decided to take advantage of their powerlessness to make some money off of that. And it's just a pretty commonplace run-of-the-mill problem that happens across Massachusetts all the time. And it's just like this, except this is on a much larger scale. And the effort to conceal information is trouble. Yes, sir. Uh, I want to ask, uh, what's motivating the people to want to have this Olympics in Boston, this secret uh, crowd that you've talked about? Why do they want to do it? I mean, I, it, it seems like they, they figure they're going to make money, yes. that, that little select group. So why don't, why don't we say that if that's the case? They want, they, they want to make money, that much I believe. I mean, all I can do is go by what their statements are as well. I know they believe they can make money. Um, I, I actually believe that many of them think that this actually is a very prestigious thing for Massachusetts. You know, they've said many, many times, this thing that Andy was talking about, putting Massachusetts on the map, putting Boston on the map. You hear this? Like the big dig. Yeah. <laughs> right, I mean, you could, you could make that comparison. But it, it's this very strange kind of thing, make Boston an international city. You know, I, Boston is an international city. It's just a very odd thing to talk about. They, they, they say things in the bid documents how it will help further drive our innovation economy. You know, how? They'll say things like this will make sports something that, or they use sport, they use the singular, I never heard this before. But they talk about sport as, as something that will be a legacy that people will now be involved in sports. It was like, if there's one thing we've got, yeah. right? Do we have any problem with people saying, God, Mass, if there's one thing no one thinks about with Boston is sports. You know, if only we could find some way to tie these together. Um, you know, it's, it, it really is that kind of a thing. So I, it, it's very hard to say. Now, you, you read, Marty Walsh gave a speech, a very impassioned speech the other day about how important he thought this was to the future of Boston. And he says, this is the other thing that they talk about, is that it's a planning exercise. That it's going to make it possible for us to actually plan for 2030, which is the 400th anniversary of the city of Boston, and plan for what Massachusetts looks like in 2040 because of the fact that we've got this Olympics coming up in 2024. And the theory is that this will force that discussion. John Fish, who's the head of Boston 2024, head of Suffolk Construction, the largest construction company in, in New England, uh, has said he wants to force a conversation about these types of things. Um, so I, there's a lot of these things that are all mixed up together in this, in this ball of what the motivations are. And again, we don't really know exactly what those motivations are in particular, but these are the things that they've said. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. If you if you read the IOC documents, they talk about a variety of advantages and benefits for most of the games. And one of them that they stress is that it creates a culture of sport and exercise, so that the population will become healthier. Here, here, here again. I, I, if if that were true, then that would be a benefit. Um, but there's no evidence for it. And in, in fact, in, in England, the, the year after that, in 2013, there were fewer, according to their national statistics, fewer people were engaged in exercise than in, in 2012 and 2011. And in 2014 in London, there were still fewer people than there were in 2013. Um, the planning exercise stuff. I think this is, you know, we, we, do, we do need to have planning. Uh, we don't have sufficient planning. We certainly don't have sufficient democratic planning. But Organizing the Olympics in order to get some planning done is like cutting a piece of butter with a chainsaw. Uh, we, need, we, need, we, we need to learn how to plan without hosting the Olympics, without hosting sport mega events. It should be a normal part of our political process. And in fact, it's in, it's in this, the city constitution of Boston that each new mayor has to come forward and put out a plan for the city. Well, he, he, there's, mayor Walsh has, has an opportunity. He has a vehicle, as does Governor Baker. There's a similar clause in the state constitution. They have vehicles. If they want us to do planning, we don't have to host the Olympics. At least I hope we don't to, to, do, to do planning. Uh, in terms of Western Massachusetts, I, we, there are a lot of politicians who are saying that uh, if we can bring some games, if we can bring some basketball, early round basketball competition to Springfield, and we can bring early round basketball competition to Holyoke, and we can bring some of the canoe events or, or the kayaking events out to the Westfield River, then maybe we'll be able to convince Boston finally to have an east-west uh, fast, fast, fast rail. We, we, public transportation between 
Western Mass in Boston would be fantastic to have that. Except I think it's much less likely if we host the Olympics than if we don't host the Olympics because we're not going to have any money to build that. So I think there, there's a certain cynicism when Rishi Neal gets up there and says this is an opportunity to finally get some public transportation in Boston. Yes. What's the mechanism by which the taxpayers of the Commonwealth would become responsible for overrun costs? Well, it's, it's a contractual requirement of the IOC for the host city okay. to assume that financial risk. Okay, and then the governor of the state. I mean, they, they obviously have a, they, the governor of the mayor of Massachusetts signs a contractual. This is a really, really important, interesting point that you're raising. And I think this is where one thing that I could tell that the IOC doesn't quite get how Massachusetts works. Because London is a huge city in the, in, embedded in England, and so you could sign that intelligence. LA, you know, I know they were a little bad, but it's a huge place. Boston is this small city with a $2.7 billion budget. They can't possibly have a cost overrun guarantee that's worth what they needed to be worth. In the bid documents, they said that the transportation projects here are backed by the full faith and credit of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And that's the thing that is going to be on the top. There's no way that they could, they could afford to do it. Now, there's been talk about getting an insurance policy for these things. There was issues around this in Chicago when they were going after their bid to try to get a, a private insurance policy to backstop it. The challenge with this is that cost overruns are one thing, but there's this other issue, which is as happened in London, where you have sponsors that don't show up, or some other issue that takes place that makes it, so, which would not be covered typically under that kind of coverage. But again, we're not even having those conversations. It's important that we do this. Chicago had a policy that was for, for $1.03 billion in cost, and the premium was something like $80 million to get that. So if, if, if Boston were able to buy such a policy, we would cover about 1 20th of our expense, and we'd have to spend, we'd have to put down $80 million for the premium. It's not, it's not a, a, a viable way to, to ensure anything. However, I mean, if Mr. Fish is, is serious about it, covering it with insurance, and let them go and raise the private money and, and, and buy insurance for the whole kit and caboodle, not just for $1 billion. He won't do it. You're, you're ahead of the I'm sorry. Uh, I, I need to agree that there, the state should be doing some planning and Boston should be doing planning, but people get bored with planning exercises that they feel aren't driven by some big event, some critical necessity. So I think that the Olympics really does have the opportunity to get the Boston metropolitan area and the state really thinking about what our future should be. And part of that relies heavily on some pretty critical investments in infrastructure, public transit, but also some housing issues in the Boston area that we know are going to be driven by the changing demographics there that are really speaking to a young millennial crowd moving in and displacing a lot of working families from the Boston area. Mm -hmm. This Olympic, and my daughter's a, a student at UMass Boston, dealing with not living on campus, to bring a, an Olympic village with those type of housing, just like they did at the University of Utah when they brought the Salt Lake Olympics in there. There's some wonderful student housing that was created as a result of that effort. If not the Olympics, what will drive the Commonwealth and the leadership in, this, in the state to make the critical investments in both housing and in infrastructure? Look, right. if we really depend on the Olympics to do this, what, what happens after 2024? What happens into the next century? Don't we have to know how to do this without hosting a mega event? We're not going to host the Olympics. Mayor Walsh himself said it's a once in a, once in a century opportunity. This is something we have to integrate into our political process. But look, if, if Boston does host the games, and if they spend 20 to $30 billion, which they will, um, there will be several billion dollars, I don't know if it's two billion or five billion, of worthwhile investments. You'll have dormitories at Columbia Point, that, that's valuable. I don't know if it's what our priority should be for Boston or Massachusetts, but that would be a valuable thing. Um, I'm not sure what else, but there'll be some other valuable things as well. Look, the, the, here's, here's part of the problem. Right now, as an illustration, right now, there's this area called Wadette Circle that's south of, south of the South Station by several hundred yards. It's got about 70 acres there. 20 of those acres are used by a company that's called Boston, New Boston Food Company. It's a wholesale food company. Restaurants depend on go going there in the morning, getting fresh fish, getting fresh vegetables and fruit and so on and so forth. Another 20 acres or 30 acres are occupied uh, by the MBTA. They use it as a docking and repair station for the red line. 
It's been there for, I'm, I'm told, four or five decades. They've been doing repair work in, in, in that acreage. Oil and other chemicals have been dumped in that land for decades. The remediation issue there is going to be immense. Um, and there's no place to put. They don't, at least they haven't designated or identified another, another 30 acres where they can put the docking and, and repair station for the red line. Do we really want to have a planning mechanism that obligates us to put an Olympic stadium on that land? Is that, is that the way that we should be planning for our city if we're going to have to kick out the, the Boston uh, Wholesale Food Corporation, we're going to have to kick out the, the, the red line docking station and repair yards? I don't think that makes a lot of sense. With, with regard to Columbia Point, in the bid documents that, that Evan's been referring to, they say in the bid documents that 25% of all the land that they're going to need to host the Olympics will, is private land. And that they said that they're in negotiations with the private land holders to buy that land. So once the bid is actually released in, in mid-January, or some of the bid documents are released, then it, it comes out that they're planning to use Columbia Point and they're planning to use with that circle. The Boston Whole Foods Corporation says, my gosh, this is news to us. Nobody talked to us about it. And there's a real estate company in Columbia Point that runs the Double Day, not the Double Day, the, uh, I don't remember the name. They have, a, they have a hotel there, plus they have some real estate interests there. And they've been expanding. They want to expand more. They were planning to buy more land in that area. They're not willing to sell. So what's going to happen? There's going to have to be a negotiation. Uh, if the negotiation doesn't work, then there's going to have to be eminent domain. If there's eminent domain, there'll be a legal suit. That'll be additional costs. I don't think that's the way to plan either. Uh, so I, I, my answer is that I don't have a, a magic bullet about how we're going to start planning well, but I think we better think about it. Because whether we host the Olympics or not, it's something, it's a tool that we're going to need. One other thing on this planning point, because I agree with you completely about the need for this kind of planning and the impact on making sure we've got housing and transportation infrastructure in place. Um, I found, I, I can say as a candidate for governor, talking about that issue, this was one of the centerpieces of what we talked about in my campaign, was building this kind of planning infrastructure in Massachusetts, and it's hard to get people to pay attention to it. So I am, I am uh, what's the right word for this, sympathetic to the idea that the Olympics could help do that. The, the challenge that we've got is that, and this is why, again, I say, well, who gets to pick? Who gets to pick? And this process is what it's about. You, Fort Point Channel is an is a area in Boston that is a growing area because of what's been happening down in the so-called innovation district. And they've been engaged in a lot of planning in that neighborhood for the way they want to see their area be over the next number of years. And they're very fixated on these kinds of issues that you're talking about. Affordable housing, walkable communities, access to transit, and all this stuff. They've had, I think, something like 60 public meetings on this. Imagine their surprise when they go and they have a master plan and they look in the bid documents from Boston 2024 and they find that all the work that they've done is not only not incorporated, it's just been completely ignored. And in fact, what they're used, talking about is taking land that they've slated for things like housing, commercial development are gonna have it for parking lots and for satellite uh, um, transmission for athletic games. This, this says to people that are actually doing the work of planning that your work doesn't matter. You just don't matter because there's something else that's much more important than your ability to plan. And that is making sure that these Olympic Games take place. So to me, this, this again is so much about the process. Planning is about process. A lot of people have faith that this process is, is something that they can be connected to and be a part of. And to go through that, imagine that 60 public meetings. You develop your master plan and then these guys come and that now becomes the centerpiece. And by the way, you never would have known about it if it wasn't for the fact that people were agitating to get this information out to the public. So if we do want to have planning, it's got to start with people having confidence and faith in the process. And I don't disagree with John Fish, you know, the head of Boston 2024. He says maybe this helps force those conversations. Great, we're here. We're probably not here if it's not the fact that they did it. I don't think that's the best way to go about doing it, but it doesn't matter. We're here. Let's take advantage of the opportunity. Yes. So there are Olympics every two years, and there are multiple bids for each Olympics. Um, are there ways that this bid differs to make it worse for the community and the surrounding area than other bids, or are most Olympic bids this damaging economically to their environment? You're talking about the ecological environment or the social environment? No, I said economically. The economic? Yeah. Um, is the Boston bid worse, or does every community have this problem and some of them just choose to go through with it anyways. Well, I have to go 
over particular examples. I mean, the one that we're going to see in 2016 is, is, is horrific for the community in Rio. They've, they've leveled favelas or shanty towns. Um, they have taken an area that's south of the main beach area, a place called Baca de Tijuca, that is, um, it's, it used to be a very, very pure uh, area by the sea, un, not very developed, and they're, they're developing it. There's marsh, there's marshland there that they're building a golf course on. Uh, I, I think it's been ecologically and socially tremendously destructive, and much more so than Boston would be. As far as we know, we haven't, they, as they tell us every, every day, that their plans aren't finalized. Um, in, in Sochi, there was tremendous devastation and social dislocation. Um, in, it, it, I think it varies. Generally speaking, the, the more developed the city is, the less has to be done. And so the less dislocation there's going to be. Uh, on this point, the, and I'll, I'll come to you next, next back there. Um, the um, IOC put out a document recently, or before this bid was put together, called the, what do they call it, Agenda 2020? Or? Yeah, Agenda 2020. And what they were trying to do is that the history of these games always had these kinds of ebbs and flows of numbers of cities that want to bid on the games. And we're in one of those ebbs right now, driven by the amount of money that was spent in Beijing and in Sochi, and people are saying, I don't know. Munich and Stockholm, two places recently voted to say no, no Olympics here. Something that I, I would like us to be able to do, but they, but they, they voted. And they said, we're not up for this. And um, they came out with this thing where they said, listen, what we should be doing is having more compact kinds of games that are lower cost so that they could be more palatable for the people in the places where they're happening. And the people that wrote Boston 2024 said that they were trying to fit into that agenda of the IOC. So when they keep talking about walkable, compact games, that's what this is about. Again, the challenge that's there is that the numbers haven't really moved all that much from what we've seen from prior Olympic Games in terms of the amount of money that's being proposed to be spent. And we have this problem of the kind of scope creep that you see in massive projects like this, where again, we're talking about basketball in, in, um, in Springfield and Holyoke and New Bedford maybe for sailing, and everyone wants to be able to, hey, let's pull it these different directions. I mean, it's fascinating because John Fish said, hey, think about this. He, he, he could be pretty you know, inspirational on this. He said, um, we could have, preliminary round baseball in Wrigley Field and Yankee Stadium, and then the final at, at Fenway. Well, these are not walkable, right? <laughs> I, I don't think. And, but again, it, it's sort of, it, it's, it's, it's how you get, how do you get from a situation where you bid 14 billion and it turns into 20? Well, you start making Chicago part of Boston, it starts to add a lot of money. So yes, yes. with you know, sex work, the drug trade, um, all kinds of things that can be really troubling and harmful to a city. And, and uh, I know that Vancouver, there was a study done for Vancouver that showed that there were extreme harms that were uh, created around uh, that kind of underground economy. So that's one. And the other, um, and you just touched upon a little bit, but I'm really curious about the potential destruction of, um, of places and homes neighborhoods that need to be you know, quote unquote cleaned up to uh, present a, a good face to the international community that's coming. So that a lot of poor neighborhoods, um, poor people were displaced, indigenous people I know in Vancouver, for instance, were displaced. So I'm curious about those two things. Uh, I, I, another example of, of displacement occurred in Atlanta. Uh, the, the, um, the dormitories that they built for Georgia State that came out of the Olympic Village, they, they, they took a African-American and Hispanic community and just pushed everybody out, created a lot of homelessness. Um, and then they engaged in a lot of arrests and repression in the downtown area just before and during the Olympics. And also where they built the, the stadium for the Braves, there was a low-income community, primarily African-American as I understand it, and they were pushed away. They're pushed out also. And that stadium, of course, is now itself going to be demolished because the Braves have decided they, have, they want to play in the suburbs again. Um, I, I can't speak to what's going to happen in terms of the underground economy in, in Boston. I, I don't know. But, but I think whenever you disturb, whenever you disturb an equilibrium, things happen that are un, unanticipated. But I, I don't have enough 
uh, information to come from that. Well, one thing I'll say about this issue of underground economy and sex trafficking, and it was good that the mayor of Boston recently started a commission on this exact issue, but at one of the public meetings, they've been having these public meetings, the Boston 2024 folks, a person asked a question about that. And they were actually booed and um, uh, dismissed by the people from Boston 2024 that were representing it. And Ayanna Pressler is one of the city councilors. You know, she she was she didn't wasn't there, but she had written a pretty strong statement about it afterwards, saying that that was shameful. Um, I think there's a lot of issues that are like that that are real, and that are <coughs> happening out there in the world that no one wants to talk about, and they aren't included in what's going on here. Now, we were just meeting yesterday with a group in Boston uh, that is in, you know, it's, it's in, it's in uh, Roxbury, Mattapan, Dorchester. Uh, they're organizing about this. They know that there's a lot of education that needs to happen for people in the community. But I'll tell you what, the, the language that was being used by people at that meeting around what they think the impact of these games is going to be, it was pretty strong. You know, talking about the idea being, that the idea of the games was to have this kind of displacement happen because it was an opportunity to grab land and make it more valuable. Now, they're seeing intention where maybe it doesn't exist there, but I have to tell you, I don't, I don't have a good argument on the other side because I've heard John Fish say that part of what this is about is increasing property values. He said that. Um, he made this odd statement about this is about increasing property values outside of 128 by increasing property values inside 128. I, I was there when he said that at one of the first community meetings. I honestly don't even know what that means. I mean, I know it's English, but I, I don't understand how that works. Um, but for people living in those communities, they're looking at what has happened in the past. They look at what's happening now. They know about gentrification that's already happening in their communities, and they're saying, this is the next thing. This is the next thing. Um, I, it's, it's, it's easy to increase property values if, if you level poor communities and you, you build up uh, middle income and higher income communities, if you gentrify an area, there'll be higher property values. Uh, and generally speaking, what will happen if people get displaced from an inner circle, then they move to the outer circle, so then the, the demand for housing in the outer circle raises rents and raises property values in the outer circle. So that's quite possible. I'm not, I'm not sure why that's, uh, that's a benefit from, from hosting the games. I wanted to also comment on uh, when when Evan was quoting uh, John Fish about playing games in Wrigley and Yankee Stadium in Fenway Park, it's important to point out that, um, at least according to the Boston Globe yesterday, that of all of the, 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 the venues and the partners that Boston 2024 says it has, there's only one that it has a formal agreement with. All the other ones have just had conversations with. The agreement they have is with UMass Boston. UMass Boston has signed on to the idea of an Olympic village that would be partially on, on their land. Uh, but they, they, don't, they don't have a deal with, uh, yet with Rick Rusbeck to use the, the TD Bank Garden. Uh, they don't have a deal yet with the Crafts. I think they'll get one but to, use, to use Foxborough for some of the soccer. They certainly don't have a deal with John Henry to use uh, Fenway Park. John is very critical of this effort. Um, and, and, and as I said before, all of, all of the private money that they said they're going to be getting, none of that, none of that is written down anywhere. And nobody has come forward and identified themselves as willing and ready partners for Boston 2024. Yes, sir. Which legislators are the sympathetic to the Um, if you want to go to the No, which legislators are sympathetic to us? To, yes. I mean, as human beings? <laughs> <laughs> No, there, 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 was a, uh, there was a move in um, the Boston delegation. It's uh, led by uh, Rep. Uh, Michaelowitz to file a bill to seek transparency and oversight on uh, both bid documents and spending. Um, this was the bill that I was referencing where the consensus is that it's not going to go anywhere, even if it's going to end up with a lot of co-signers. Um, so there's, there's been limited numbers of people. Jamie Eldridge. Uh, has raised a lot of issues around this, and I know from what I've uh, read of his comments that a lot of this is driven both by his own view of it, but also what he's been hearing from his constituents. Um, but it's, this is where I say it's been very interesting, the level of silence on a lot of these issues. Now, maybe people are waiting to see, but we don't know. Uh, in Boston, there was a, a proposal put in the Boston City Council by a councilor named Josh Zakem to have a citywide referendum on this. Um, Again, most people don't believe that it will pass through the city council. Michelle Wu is a city councilor, has been 
asking a lot of tough questions, but we're not seeing a lot of it from our state legislators. We're just not. And, and again, this to me is part of the reason why we have to have people organized as voters for a referendum. In the absence of there being, I was, I was asked yesterday by the Boston Herald when they, they saw that Duvall, uh, that Governor Patrick was now working with Boston 2024, they said, do you think now this runs the risk of politicizing the Olympics? <laughs> and, and I said, it would be kind of interesting if it became politicized, because it actually isn't right now. Um, but I don't see it working that way, and, and that's fundamentally the issue, is that we don't see, we, there's this, again, this strange overlap. What's government, what's Boston 2024? So many people that are moving back and forth and no oversight, no real oversight. So it's limited. Can I add something to that? Yeah, I'm going to go to the one uh, next. Speaker DeLeo and Stan Rosenberg and, and Charlie Baker have um, put out a notion that they want to hire a consultant to make sure that Boston doesn't have to backstop the games. I'm not sure why they need a consultant for that. They can simply pass a bill to say that. But it, I, th I think that there are, a lot, there are a lot of representatives out there right now who are really, really concerned, who at the same time are not willing to step, put their foot down and say, I'm, I'm dead against this, this is a bad idea, because there's a good old boys network that they don't want to alienate if they don't have to. So they're treading very gingerly. But I think there's a potential base in the legislature to, uh, to rile up and, and, and get on and the one other thing, I'm going to go over here one sec. One other thing about this is that, keep in mind, the other thing that's on the legislator's mind right now is there is a $1.5 billion budget deficit, which is going to be apparently closed off with a lot of one-time changes, which means that in the next 12 months, we're going to be dealing with this issue again. A lot of these things are structural, so there's a lot of big issues. Now, one could look at that and say, well, then why are we even having this conversation about the Olympics? But really, simply, you'd say, this is why we're having this conversation about the Olympics. I'm not one of those people, but you understand that. The, the theory, yes. They raise, they raise private money. They've got private money. They raise that. private. They're going to end up spending between seventy-five million and hundred million dollars for the bid if it goes for the full two, two more years, two and a half more years. And they say that they're doing that with private money. So far, they've done it with private money. Uh, but as Evan points out, there's, they're encumbering the time and the resources of the city and the state. Um, so it's not really free. There are lots of hidden costs here down the road. One of the interesting things is in, in, in the, uh, the IOC puts out a document that's this thick. It's called the uh, Brand Protection. It's a technical manual on brand protection. And on page 60 of that manual, it says in no uncertain terms, that if this, the city that hosts the Olympics has to pay control over all advertising in the city for a month prior to the games, the games, and then several weeks after the games. And then it's specified by all advertising, trains, subways, buses, highways, all outdoor advertising. So what does that mean? It means that the, all of the MBTA advertising would have to be cleared um, and made available for Olympic sponsors and, and the Olympic marks. Uh, it means that all of the outdoor, outdoor billboards that you see around Boston would have to be cleared. The MBTA wouldn't be getting advertising revenue. The city wouldn't be getting certain advertising revenue. And they would have to reimburse the owners of the private billboards. That's an expense. Uh, it's, it's certainly millions of dollars. I don't know exactly how much it is. Uh, it's not in the bid document. There are lots of expenses like that. Yes. A little hesitant to say anything. My name is Annie Drummond. I'm the executive director of the Greater Chicopee Chamber of Commerce. And um, Speaker DeLeo was out here a couple times last year with his tale, and we asked him to address the tale of two commonwealths. And what I've seen so far is a lack of knowledge on the part of not just the general community, but the business owners. And when they said anything, we had a meeting of our government affairs committee, the thing is, oh, that's never going to happen. That, that'll never happen because they don't know all of this. And I don't know, you know what you just said about the advertising and you know, businesses that pay for this and all of that is gonna impact them. I don't know how you're going about mobilizing possibly the chambers of commerce across the state. Because you're gonna be alone. Pardon? We're talking about you to do that. All right, give me a call. But you know, we, have, <laughs> we have 380 businesses in our chamber of commerce that represents about 12,000 employees. I'm not going to take a side one way or the other publicly, 
but I think the information needs to get out there in a very responsible way. And right now, Western Mass is not being included except for this in the discussion. Yeah, they have. To my there, there, there's no meetings planned, I believe, in Western Massachusetts. They originally were having eight. Seven, April 2nd, but I can't get any information. Okay, so maybe there will be one, which would be good. In Springfield. In Springfield. They had originally nine meetings scheduled just for Boston. Um, interestingly, one of them is after the date at which the final bid gets submitted to um, by the USOC to the IOC. Uh, I've been at I've been at one. Um, we've had other people at others. I, I went to the one and I sat there, and all the meetings have been the same. There's been a very nice presentation that gets done. The architect does most of the talking. This guy David Manfredi, who's, who's a talented guy, um, but it's it's all very broad brush. It's almost a bit of a filibuster and a lot of stuff. Then there's questions that come from the audience. A lot of it never gets addressed. It's very, it's a, it's a bit of a frustrating presentation to sit through, uh, but they're, but they are starting to go out in other parts of the state. But you are not seeing this level of disclosure. It's not happening anywhere. It's in the bid documents. All you got to do is read them. But it's a lot to wade through, and it's a lot to try to understand the context of what it all means. And um, <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, details that are not included, as Andy's pointing out. So one, one of the things we're doing is events like this with, as United Independent Party. And it's just like, here's, here's the deal. You have a right to know. Let me, because I know you guys both have asked questions. This, and so, George. Um, I'm George, and, and I know this could be a very, very large construction project project connected to the Olympics. Um, <clears throat> so I'm drawn to the comparison of perhaps uh, the process with the big dig, which was a more complex construction project, a lot of tunneling, water involved and whatnot. But, but again, I, I believe we're still bearing some of the cost for that. And I wonder if either of you could speak to that and how that funding works and the long-term debt that might be involved. And they did. Well, let me, let me tell you, I brought some information on the Big Dig. Um, the Big Dig, obviously, is a government project. So that's one difference here. Um, where there was a process of deciding this was something that we wanted to do, these were going to be the funding streams were going to be used to do it. Now, it turned out in the course of this process that they ran over by a little <laughs> cost. I mean, it was, it was supposed to be about a, about a three or four billion dollar uh, project that's ended up being, if we commit in all, all the, the interest expense and there were the other expenses for the additional public transit improvements that were required, it's going to be somewhere between 20 and 25 billion dollars all in for this. And it's created a big problem in Massachusetts. It's a bit like, you know, if a snake eats a large animal, it's got to digest that thing before it can do anything else. And we've got this huge amount of fat that's sitting inside of the snake, right, being digested. And a huge portion of that, over $3 billion, was actually placed on the books of the MBTA, which is one of the reasons why the MBTA has so many problems that it has. I mean, there is no free lunch at the end of the day. And so either if you're going to decide to spend money on one thing, it's going to displace other priorities. And so the Big Dig was a decision that was made to go ahead and do this. You could argue forever about whether it's been a net benefit in terms of just the, the life of the city of Boston as someone who commutes into Boston all the time. It's actually not bad. It's actually been pretty good. We're getting to the airport and all that kind of stuff. But again, at what cost? At what cost? Now, again, at least in that case, we had public process involved. Yes, it ended up being terrifically expensive. No question about it. Yes, it's diverted our ability to do a lot of other things that are there. So I, I'm not standing here saying, isn't the Big Dig awesome? But at least there was a process. At least we're informed about it. At least we understand what's going on. This promises to be as much money for a thing that we have not decided that we want to do. Other people have. Other people have. And that, to me, is fundamentally what it's about. So the big day cost a lot of money. There's no two ways about it. And it had massive cost overruns. And it, is, it has saddled the Commonwealth of Massachusetts with an enormous amount of debt. Can I add also that with regard to the big dig, at least there was a vision. And the vision was to tear down the concrete and put grass there and to open the city to the sea. Uh, it cost a lot of money, but we had a plan. We had something we wanted to accomplish. And what we accomplished seems to be valuable, whether it's worth $20 billion or not is another question. With the Olympics, we're going to be doing the opposite. We're going to be taking a lot of undeveloped land that has grass on it and putting concrete on it. And then tearing down the stadium, if I understood you correctly. Yeah, yeah. A 60,000 seat stadium is yeah. going to displace the, the businesses that you mentioned yeah. only to then tear it down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the selling point of the stadium is that it'll be built and torn down. So this is sort of like you dig a hole and fill it in. Now, maybe that's a smart thing to do. I don't know. But let's, let's vote on it. 
Did you have a question with your hand up before? I'm sorry. I did. I was just wondering if the, uh, if, if all the transportation can be handled under 128 and all that in Boston, because already in the summer, a lot of people go down to the Cape, and the road is usually pretty busy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I haven't done a traffic study. All right. Anecdotally, I would say I can't imagine how, but who knows? Maybe everybody will leave like they did in London, and then it'll be really easy. But think, here's this was um, oh, I was in here, and I just I just enjoy reading bid documents because I may be um, I don't know nuts, but what they what they talk about in these bid documents. Here's what they say about Massachusetts and about Boston. Boston Massachusetts is a leader in public transportation. Did you know that? <laughs> and number one bullet, built and opened the first subway in the U.S. in 1897. Okay, so that's a, we're still using it. And it's a true statement. I'm not gonna disagree with it. That's true, it's in here. It's on my iPad, it's true. So they said that, so that's nice. Um, we are situated at the northern terminus of Amtrak's Northeast Corridor the busiest high-speed rail corridor in the United States. I mean, I've written these cell, it's nice, but I, I, if you were taking a European and dropping them into the United States, say, hey, by the way, here's our awesome high-speed rail corridor. I'd say, is this the train you get on to get onto the high-speed rail? No. You know, is this the, you know, is this the shuttle? Um, excellent interstate and regional highway access. Okay, now, I, I live west of Boston, it's good. Uh, Kyle, who works for us, lives south of Boston. Is it good? No. Is it excellent? Not close. <laughs> um, you know, apparently we have six regional international airports. Um, and, um, yeah, and they, they talk about acceleration and innovation economy. So, again, this is what's been proposed, and it, it is a little bit laughable when you see it. You can also, on some level, say maybe you didn't want us, the public to see that. But it's overselling, you know? Show us the real deal. Tell it, be honest. A leader in public transportation? because we built the first subway in 1897. Come on. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I've already spoken, but I'll try That's one okay. more time. Uh, you know, I, I, what I find is this is a very difficult conversation. The reason this is an extraordinarily major project, and you make it sound as the city hall in Boston has abandoned good sense. The government of, of Massachusetts has abandoned good sense. There's really nothing out there. They're going to do tons of stupid things. And, I mean, this may all be true. This may be, and our governor, who I love, he's now on the wrong side. He's, he's fighting for the bad fight. So, so what strikes me is how can you have such a big project where there's not more thought going into it? responsible people who care about the state and the city and house. I mean, for example, if it would result in something good happen uh, for Holyoke, I'd say bravo. Now, the other thing I would ask, our governor's a good buddy of the president. Maybe he can get some money out of Washington to help with the railroad. You're, You're talking, talking about our ex-governor, right? You're mm -hmm. talking about the ex-governor. You mean our ex-governor? Our ex-governor, yeah. of course, our ex-governor. And so, uh, the, the, the point is, you know, it, it just sounds, it, it sounds so stupid. It sounds so stupid with no structure. I mean, if you're gonna tear up half of down, or a good chunk of downtown Boston, you'd think city, you know, they do have a zoning board, they do have this, they do have that. It's like abandonment, abandonment to money. Yeah. I mean, it's like we're hearing about like, how bad Washington is, abandonment to let, money. Let, let me just say this, I mean, Andrew's written a book that basically documents that exact point. I have a hard time, because I speak a lot about this topic. And it is hard for me when I'm describing, because it does come off that way, that this sounds so breathtakingly dumb to be and doing anti -democratic. this. Anti-democratic. And anti-democratic, and yet it's happening. It's happening. It's and, not new either. And it's not, it's not new. No, this is America in the 21st century, frankly. And, and, I, and I think what, this is the thing that people have to also recognize, is that I believe that the IOC would very much like to see the Olympics in the United States. Because they've got a multi, 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 multi billion dollar TV deal with Comcast, which is NBC. And they haven't had the Olympics in the United States for some time, and they would love to have it in the Eastern Time Zone. Right? So the idea that this really could happen in America is serious and underappreciated. And I'm, I'm with you. I think there's a lot of stuff that's happening in our country that's not democratic, and it is not in the best interest of most people. And it, yet it's happening. Well, let me say, if you wanted the uh, okay, let's say this, what you just said is correct. Mm -hmm. As a negotiator, I would say to the Olympic Committee, 
Good. You can kick in $5 billion if you want to have it in the United States. Let's negotiate. Let's talk about how you're going to back it up sure. if it doesn't make it up. I mean, you, you should be the guy. I'm with you. I'm you you know? But think about this. If, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm in charge of Boston 2024, yeah. all right, what, what do I need to bother doing that to the IOC for? I, I, I've, got the, I've got everybody I need. The taxpayers will provide that for me. Why do I need to bother the IOC? Maybe they won't pick me now, and I can't make any money out of this. What's my guy? What's, what's the current guy doing? He doesn't care. He just, you know. So All I can tell you, this is what I tell you about spend our, money. That's his characteristic. Yeah. Isn't it? Well, here's what I can tell you about our current governor. So Bill Weld is at ML Strategies. Bill Weld is is very supportive of what's going on with the Olympics, and I am sure that he's had a conversation or two with the governor about this topic. So I don't know what's going on. I don't know. It doesn't look good. Joel, let me, let me just add something. Yeah. Um, right now, all that's happened for Boston is that Boston has been anointed the U.S. representative in an international competition. Uh, we are going to be up against, Boston is going to be up against probably Rome and Paris and either Berlin or Hamburg and Budapest and Doha uh, and Baku and maybe Melbourne. Um, until last week, it looked like maybe Durban or Johannesburg also. So the, that's our competition internationally. And if, if Mayor Walsh decides he's going to stick out his chest and, and tell Thomas Bach, the president of the IOC, we want $5 billion from you in order to convince us to host the games, Thomas Bach is going to say, take a shower. Um, and well, so maybe he should do that. But the, the notion that this is a simple matter, once, once we decide we're, we're in this for the win, which they say, Mayor, Mayor Walsh said it the other day, we're doing this because we want to win the games. Once you're doing that, then you've got to compete. And one of the concerns that I have is that when, when they talk about the, the 60,000 capacity stadium without luxury boxes, but then they're going to be up against Rome that's going to have 80,000 seats in luxury boxes, where that's going to be presented elsewhere, that they're going to have to up the ante. And this is, why, this is why you always have cost overruns in the Olympics. So we're going to actually be going in the opposite direction. We're not going to go in the direction of you've got to give us money. We're going to go in the direction of let us show, show you even more how much we love you, IOC. Yeah, I would respond to the statement they're desperate to have it in the United States. That's, that's what I would They're not say. desperate. Oh. They would like it. Secondly, if it's in Paris, the French government will pick up the check at the end of the day, not the city of Paris. Is that right? Am I correct on, on assuming that's the way things work in France? I think Mayor Hidalgo would like that to be the case. I don't know if it will be. It's more likely to be the case. It's more likely to be the case, though. Is, is the good? IOC a for-profit organization? No. It's not? No. No. But, look, 90% of the revenue that they take in, they distribute it to the international federations, the sports federations, and to the NOCs, the National Olympic Organizations. They keep ten million dollars, and they can—I'm not shooting ten percent—and they live very handsomely with that ten percent. But there's there's no uh, recipient who, who who's getting profits at the end of the day. So, do we have any more questions? There's one more right here. Yep. Yeah. Hold on. No, the, the surplus. Twenty percent of the surplus is supposed to be shared with the with the IOC, but the surpluses are they're again they're only for the the operating budget, the o, the OCOG, the only for the OCOG budget, um, and they're very when there is a surplus, an accounting surplus, it's very very small. It, the LA the LA games are the only ones that generate the appreciable surplus. So, so I don't get a wrap. Yeah, I think we're going to wrap up so that we have enough time for individual discussion and, and clean up the floor or rental space. So if, and yeah, well, but I think if you each want to say one thing and then um, everyone can come here and look at, um, number one, thank you, George, for putting uh, the Economist article that Andrew sent to me and that mentioned his book. There are pictures of before and after Olympic stadiums across the world and they're very interesting. There's Andrew's book, 
and there's also uh, United Independent Party information and ways to sign up to hear, hear about it in the future. Um, and I want to thank uh, Bess uh, for selling the book and John Riley for being here um, for Northampton Community TV. He tells me that it will be up on John? By the end of the week, and, and it'll be on YouTube. And it'll be on week. YouTube. And uh, I also want to thank Emily Democrat for being my contact, and Kyle. I'm sorry, I don't Gil. Say it again. Gil. Gil. Kyle Gill uh, from Evans' office for working with me on this. Taylor was my main contact, but uh, he wasn't able to be here. I want to thank both of you for being here uh, and trusting that this this process would work together. So if you'd like to say your closing arguments, we will have time to. Closing arguments. Closing arguments. To the jury, please, 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 please sign up. Please just sign up so we can keep you in the loop. If you want to help with this effort and to get information from us, we're, we're here. So that's what that there for. If you're not registered to vote, register to vote. For God's sake, register to vote. And if you're going to register to vote, register with the United Independent Party. Right? We did. It's really easy. It's easy and it's cool. And we're, this is what we're about, doing this kind of stuff. Thank so you thank for you. doing that. Thank you thank for you. getting on the ballot. Getting 3% and putting that in Massachusetts is such a great accomplishment. Thank, Thank you. you. Enjoy the sunshine. <laughs>